Coraline is fearless. She's an explorer, she's independent, she's curious, but most importantly, she's self-reliant. Coraline had nine costumes. Her raincoat moved as one big unit. It was like animating a bell on top of your costume. The places that you could move it were at the bottom edge where there was wire, the end of the cuffs had wire, and the hood was wired so you could get some bounce to it. And with those three points of articulation, we figured out a way to make it move naturally. On the flip side, the star sweater was form-fitting on her. You could see the shape of her torso as you were animating, but it was loose enough that the animator was able to tease the sweater up and tease it down frame by frame to give the illusion that she was breathing. With so many unique costumes, each with its own look and feel, it really brought a sense of authenticity to Coraline's character. It's Coraline. Uh, Caroline Wood. Coraline. Coraline Jones. Wybie was the odd boy who lived next door. He was nosy, he was curious, he turned out to be a worthy friend. I'm Wybie. Wybie Lovett. Wybie? Short for Wyborn. Not my idea, of course. He was a challenging puppet. He had this craned neck. And if you didn't have it quite right, you could have it craned. If you didn't show a piece of the neck, it would just look like the head was sitting on the shoulders and he had no neck at all. <laughs> the way the helmet worked was interesting. You couldn't close it until you removed his ears and his face. And because it's stop motion, you're able to replace those pieces frame at a time. Nobody who watched it was ever the wiser. Wybie wasn't in the book. He was written in the screenplay as a story device for Coraline. And we all worked really hard to make sure that in the end, he was a worthwhile partner for Coraline. <laughs> the cat's character is like the wise old sage that comes to Coraline's aid, helps her to navigate the other world. You probably think this world is a dream come true, but you're wrong. With a four-legged character, you have the rhythm of the way that the legs interact with each other and that changes with the pace of the walk as well. You don't want that mechanics to feel robotic, you want the character to walk with character. With a four-legged creature you go from a walk to a trot to a run. The timing changes of each leg depending on how fast or slow the character is moving. The tail on a cat is sort of tied to its character it's a, just another way that you can show emotion and how the cat's feeling. When you have a cat that can talk, it's just another tool that you can use to convey the emotion. We cats, however, have far superior senses than humans. For all the challenges animating a cat presented, who doesn't want to animate a cool cat? There's two Mr. Babinskis, the grubby, oddly athletic neighbor who lives in the attic. Call me Mr. B, because amazing, I already know that I am. And then there's the other Babinski, who's the greatest showman on earth. Very, very thank you. I mean, animating Babinski was an incredible challenge, just because he was so top heavy. He had little spindly legs, he had little spindly arms, so he couldn't support himself, and he always had to be on a series of ball joints for a rig to help him stand up. Each Babinski had wonderful elements of their puppet where you could get fantastic secondary animation. Mr. Babinski had this belly mover so you could bounce his belly up and down. He had his medallion that could move around. Other Babinski had his epaulets and his cords. He had these long tails. Those didn't stay where you wanted them to all the time because of the weight of them. And each Babinski, of course, had his iconic mustache. Other Babinski had this beautiful, waxed, curled mustache that could bounce up and down. Real Babinski's mustache was wiry and unkempt. Because it was on a ball joint, it also had a tendency to rotate every once in a while. Mr. Babinski was the first and the last character at Leica to have stick-on eyebrows. Mr. Babinski had an incredible amount of energy. And that energy, combined with all the elements for secondary animation, made him one of the most fun in the film to animate. We loved it, Mr. B. It was so, so uh... amazing!
nothing. <laughs> the first other mother, she's very much a 50s idealized mother. You're just in time for supper, dear. She was trying to sell the idea of the other world to Coraline. You could stay here forever, if you want to. Really? Working with the button eyes, the head becomes a lot more important in the way that you animate it because that's giving you the idea of where the gaze is falling. Black is traditional. But if you'd prefer pink, or vermilion, or chartreuse. Animation is just movement cut into slices, really. You're breaking movement down into frames, which are moments in time. A movement can take a second to go from A to B, so that would be 24 separate movements. There's a flow to animation, and it's just a case of studying motion, sort of understanding just the physics of things, and then trying to applicate it. Is that any way to talk to your mother? You aren't my mother. Unlike Coraline's real father, the other father is this fun, doting character that is ready to spend lots of time with her, giving her the attention that she craves. Hello, Coraline. Like is known for replacement facial animation using 3D printed faces, but the other father still had a mechanical face. A mechanical face allowed for other father to be a much more organic feeling character. Well, everything's right in this world, kiddo. There's much more squash and stretch that we was able to do because of the joints in his face. Inside that face is armature pieces and paddles that allow you to move and manipulate the lips and jaw. We was able to get a lot of movement and exaggeration. Whoa! <laughs> he had a very organic performance and I think that made him a very endearing character. So he was really happy that he came to Coraline's aid in the end. What was interesting about the character, she loses all vestiges of her sort of human self and becomes this monstrous spider. From her point of view, her life depends on getting Coraline to stay in that other world. You know I love you. Mm. She was basically an armature, and the fact that she had four legs and two arms that made it a little bit difficult because she didn't have feet, they just ended in spikes. So we had to come up with a way of tying her down to the set so that the feet would stay planted when she moved. When you're animating a scene or a shot, certain puppets are easier to animate and you get into this flow. It's almost like this symbiotic relationship happens where sometimes the puppet will do exactly what you're asking for. There's no effort there. And then you have puppets like the Beldam where every time you touch it, it's moving in ways that you don't want it to move. And so it becomes this fight to get it to be animated in the way that you want it to. Now, you're going to stay here forever. Stop motion animation is an old technique. It's not a new idea. Uh, it goes back to the first King Kong. I'm a stop motion animator. I take the puppet and I move it frame by frame, tiny little increments. We have very expensive toys that we're moving around on a miniature set. There are 24 frames a second uh, in film. You have to move the puppet for each one of those frames. In each one of those frames, you will have to move maybe 20 little pieces, fingers and arms and legs and head and hair and everything else. Just move them incrementally, take a frame, move them again, take a frame, move them again, and take a frame. And when you do it enough times, makes it look like the character, puppet, whatever is moving. I've been trying to explain this to my parents for 20 years and they still don't understand. The old Disney animators used to say that an animator was an actor with a pencil. And in our case, in stop motion, an animator is an actor with a puppet. They start the first frame and they have to move forward and they try to hit their marks like a live actor would. They try to say their lines at the right place. And you can't backtrack and you can't second guess. You've got to do it one time, one time only, hopefully, ideally. Yeah, that's kind of what's cool about it, you know, it, and because it is a performance, you know, and you don't have the ability to go back and, and save a version and tweak it and save another version and tweak it. 
Like, what you get is the way it is, and if it's not right, you have to do the whole thing over again. Really, we're looking for finding a performance, really figuring out who the character is. The biggest thing initially that informs an animator's performance is the voice acting. A lot of the acting comes from listening to that and taking what the actors already put into the performance and applying that into the puppet. We listen to the lines from the actors for cues for accents, things that they're stressing or hitting, and that will conjure up in the animator's mind a certain type of performance. When you, when you listen to the dialogue and you just look at the puppet, it, it absolutely suggests how they might act and how they might interpret the dialogue and just what presence they would have in any particular scene. Sometimes the harder shots are, are shots that you don't have any dialogue for because then you're having to create all the emotion or the tension yourself in the animation. And that can sometimes be harder because you don't have the dialogue to hide behind. I always think about, you know, girls her age. If I see someone that kind of has her posture or her attitude, I'll watch them. I try to act it out myself first, but not in front of anyone, because I don't like to act in front of people. <laughs> Some animators are total hounds when it comes to being in front of the camera. And just love acting that stuff out. I'm an animator who prefers to kind of observe and then uh, reproduce things that I observe instead of acting things out and videotaping myself and trying to copy what I'm doing. Occasionally, I'll. I look in the mirror, if I'm doing a facial expression that I'm trying to get, to kind of see how my face moves or my brows move or, or my lips will move. The beauty of it is finding the idiosyncratic things, the things that you wouldn't expect, the things that are unpredictable, and trying to kind of exaggerate those and elaborate on those and find little things that essentially define the character. The best thing is just looking at some of the other animators' work because you, you have to try and make it match that too, so it's not like Coraline's five different people. <laughs> But you never get what you want. You start one place, you have an idea of what you're gonna get, and by the time you're done, it may be good, it may be horrible, but it's never exactly what you envisioned because the puppet has a mind of its own, and we love them and we hate them, but they uh, we can never predict what they're gonna do, really. Mom, what are you doing here in the middle of the night? You're just in time for supper, dear. I initially did listen to a lot of Terry Hatcher and just try to get some of her body language and some of the, the way she would deliver things just so that the puppet is echoing some of us, the way she would handle things with her body. But mostly it's talking with Henry about who is Other Mom and where is she in the story. You're back and you brought Vermin with you. I like the transformation scenes. There's a couple of times you actually watch her transform on screen, which is really nice because it kind of bridges the gap between the different puppets that represent Other Mom. And so when you actually see her physically transforming into the more evil version of her, it's just really satisfying. One, two, three! We did a lot of animation tests where we, we tried to explore the possibilities of what she could do and find where her limitations were and then see what appealed to Henry and see what, what was working for him and what we should try to focus on and try to avoid. This one is Spank, and this is one of those characters that just by her body, she is who she is. The real Spank walks around on a walker and she can barely move at all and she's just very uh, old lady, overweight, trudging with a walker. Me Our motivation for YB was like a lovable golden retriever. Kind of subtle body language, but really it had to keep him very charming and appealing and cute because Coraline had to just instantly be drawn to him and feel comfortable with him. Oh, great! The village stalker! Ow! I, I, I wasn't stalking you. We're hunting banana slugs. I guess Babinski's been my specialty. You know, he had this whole scene where he's doing all these gymnastics and calisthenics and stuff up on his balcony, holding himself up with one arm and doing the splits and doing flips over Coraline. <sighs> his elbows like to break a lot. You can see how thin they are. So when he's trying to hold his big barrel body up and he's taking himself up, you know, up or down and doing the splits and whatnot, it's kind of a weak point. Bah, so sorry, he's nothing. Sometimes the mice are a little mixed up. <clears throat> His mustache moves, um, so you can move it up and down depending on what he's what he's saying. His brows, you take them off and they stick on and move up and down. You've got these lids, they can go up and down, and the eyes, which you can move around with a little tool. What I have here is his mouth kit. We decided that we would treat the upper part of the face and the lower part separately so you could control 
eyes, eyebrows, squints, lids, separately from mouths, therefore giving us a much greater range of, of expression. With Coraline and, and, and most of the main characters, we get our shot broken down with all the dialogue, all the expressions beforehand, and then we get a little kit here with all the replacements that we'll need for the shot. We take off little bits which are held together by tiny little magnets on her face. And then we'll grab another mouth and we just pop it on like that and the magnets hold it in place. And now we have a new expression. In the replacement faces, you're creating shapes for all the expressions. You got that, that mouth and the few mouths. One of them is closed. One of them is open. Don't worry, I'm getting the hang of it. One of the challenges in uh, typical replacement animation is that you're not able to get very much subtlety between the expressions because typically they've been sculpted and there's only so much you can do. We're, do we're using a different technique on this film, so we're able to get really kind of almost infinitesimal differences in the faces. To the naked eye, you probably wouldn't be able to see much difference between these two faces. But when you put it on the puppet, you can definitely see her cheeks will squash up a little more, her lips will tighten a little bit. And so we're able to get really beautiful, subtle movement in her face. What's great about the uh, replacement animation is that it means that there's a consistency amongst all the animators. There's a consistency of performance, especially in the, in, in the dialogue and the, the way that Coraline expresses and the other characters express. You must be the other cat. No, I'm not the other anything. I'm me. That's very interesting. It's a great character in the film, and it's Coraline's ally, even though she at first doesn't realize it. Definitely when you're in the uh, editorial with, with Henry, he's spent, obviously spent a lot of time studying cats, and he knows them well, and he knows their personality, and yeah, he, he's always got a good idea to, to bring for, for the cat. He turns out to be very brave and wise, although he can't help but torture his prey a little bit when he catches a jumping mouse. When they're in their full ratty capacity, there's about around 25 rats in a frame at one time. I would kind of look at the screen as little chunks and I would maybe have two or three rats that I would think of as a group. Some of them would jump over each other or they would interact together, but I think I would kind of go in there and get the three little guys in one part of the screen and I would animate those check it, make sure everything is fine, then okay, move on. But inevitably things do get bumped along the way, so when it was all done, I would just check it again and again and go and make little fine tweaks and stuff like that. It's the spectacle, it's the minutiae. It's the big sets with the trees and the atmospheric stuff and the wind blowing, and, and then, then you get down to the, you know, the finest little tiny bit of whatever moving around and uh, it's you have to focus on everything I mean in stop motion everything you see moving has been moved by somebody so if grass is blowing in the wind some poor animator is moving those little blades of grass to make it look like it's blowing in the wind and one of the things we're doing differently on this film is we are kind of focusing on making it very atmospheric so there's lots of environmental effects dust and and, and dirt moving there's wind and, and trees and grass and you know, cloth and hair blowing in the wind and that sort of thing. It really does add a certain level of something to the film that's pretty special. I can't believe you did this. Mother said you'd like it. It's amazing. I mean, it, it exceeds anything I ever could have imagined. People have, have brought love and passion and enthusiasm into this project, and you see it in, in every frame of the film. It's a, it's a really wonderful, incredible, charming experience.